welcome to the um, fourth Constitutional Day lecture series. Fourth lecture in the Constitutional Day series, organized by Daksh. Um, for those of you who don't, me, don't know me, I am uh, Harish Narsapa. I am one of the co-founders of Daksh. Uh, the Constitutional Day lecture series was organized, well, because we already given it, given the secret out as to when it was started, this four years ago. Um, the reason for organizing it, um, the thought process when we decided to organize the Constitutional Day Lecture Series was that um, since Daksh was working on accountability and related issues concerning institutions of governance in, in the country, we felt that apart from getting involved in day-to-day -day issues of governance, we also needed time to celebrate what is good in governance and also reflect on what we need to do to improve governance. And that's the thought process um, that went into uh, the decision to organize um, a, the Constitutional Day Lecture Series. And um, again, we were, we were thinking uh, and arguing as to when we should organize this le uh, lecture series. And the most obvious uh, dates um, were August 15th and, and Jan 26th. And then, because you know those two occasions are now pretty much taken over by the government um, and not really left for citizens, we felt that we need to um, decide on a different day. And the advantage with India is, of course, we have relevant days and significant days throughout the year. Uh, April 14th, October 2nd, you know, we can go on and on. Um, but we thought that November 26th is um, more symbolic because we were calling it the Constitutional Day Lecture Series. Of course, now, you know, what the government has done, uh, you know, this year is to take over. I, we claim that they have borrowed from us, but we don't know whether somebody actually noticed that we were organizing this lecture series. But I suppose, you know, we can claim credit for uh, converting a boring law day into Constitutional Day and, you know, uh, trying to promote the ideals of, um, of the Constitution. So, what we thought um, we will do today is, before I introduce uh, Mr. Raju Ramachandran, um, my co-founder Kishore will just give you a snapshot of Daksh's Rule of Law project. Daksh's Rule of Law project is the second significant project that we have started. And this is a um, you know, project that has been on for about a year now. Um, our primary activity when we started um, eight years ago was to evaluate performance of elected representatives. Um, and we have been doing that for the last um, eight years. Uh, the most significant um, of those uh, of that work was the um, massive survey we organized last year, just before the general elections, in collaboration with the Association for Democratic Reforms. Um, it was a survey of about 2,65,000 respondents across 520 parliamentary constituencies in the country. I think the largest ever political survey um, in the world. And the rule of law project was um, started in response to a challenge by um, Madhukar CV, who is um, the founder of uh, PRS, Parliamentary Research Service, and also now heads the Omidyar Network in India. Uh, he came to meet Kishore and me one day and um, to generally ask about how Daksh was doing and if we were serious to take the political evaluation to the next level and whether we needed funding and all of that. In the middle of the conversation, he asked, oh, why isn't anybody doing anything about any study about judicial uh, delays in particular and the judiciary in general? And he looked at me accusingly and said, you're a lawyer. I mean, what are you guys doing about it? All your lawyers are interested in is making money. Um, and uh, Kishore, you know, I think probably in ignorance at that time said, hey, this sounds interesting, why don't we do it? Uh, well, I say ignorance because over the last year, we believe he's cracked the problem of collecting judicial data and has con tremendously contributed to uh, the study of the judiciary in India. Um, so that is how the, that was the genesis of uh, the rule of law project. And coincidentally, you know, we're, today we are talking about the topic for today is, you know, judicial independence. So we thought we will, you know, first present um, what the rule of law project is. It, uh, Kishore is a co-founder of Daksh, so I'll request him to take a few minutes and 
present uh, what the rule of law project is all about. Thanks. Uh, okay, I need this. All right. Uh, my name is Kishore Mandiam. I'm uh, co-founder with uh, Harish. I'm not a lawyer. And uh, like he said, uh, ignorance for sure. And then the next step was I was completely appalled. I was appalled at the way decisions are being made in the legal system with absolutely no basis for fact. I'm sorry. I'm not talking about cases. I'm not, I'm not talking about what happens with an, inside a court. I'm not talking about what happens to a particular individual in the legal system. I'm talking about process. I'm talking about the overall, you know, the pendency issue. Everybody talks about pendency, right? You all talk about it, public talks about it, so on and so forth. And the first thing I found was that, was that there was no data. There is no data about real numbers. I mean, how many cases are out there? Okay, if you ask me on Monday, about three crores. If you ask me on Tuesday, maybe 2.6 crores, right? That's the kind of responses we were getting. And I would hear, I would sit in conferences that uh, Harish would naively invite me into, and I would listen to lawyers and judges talk about how they make decisions on what's going to be done tomorrow, day after, next month, maybe not done. There is no predictability at all. So we went out and said, okay, let's see if we can get the data together, right? Why is data important? No, I love this guy. So, I, I don't have to make a case for data. The fact is though, the Indian legal system actually has a lot of data out there. The government has put out, um, you guys will have seen it, the high courts have data, the lower courts have data, the Supreme Court has data. And in my engineer viewpoint, the data oriented viewpoint, going from the Supreme Court to the lower court, the lower you go, the better the quality of data is. Right? That's unfortunate, but that's okay. The Supreme Court has only 63,000 cases, while the lower courts have 2.6 crores or whatever is today's number. So we went out and said, let's go find those numbers. We put some software together. We put some software basically <coughs> to scrape data from these public websites. So the data that we provide to our consumers, who could be anybody here on our site, the data we provide is public data. It's not stuff that we have actually filed RTIs and so on and so forth. No, it's all there on the web. And we just found a way to convert that public, info, public data into information. Right? So today we have uh, 18 of the 24 high courts. Um, every day we're getting maybe 25,000 cases, uh, 25,000 hearings, not cases, hearings from uh, these courts. We have 357 district courts and that's being, you know, we're adding 10, 12 district courts every day. There are 16,000 odd district and lower courts in the country. And we have, we're growing by 10, 15 a week. It's not a big number, but it's a distributed sample. It's a fairly, uh, it's a strongly distributed sample in terms of uh, unpredictability and so on. So we believe that it reflects patterns across the country. If you're going to tell, uh, ask us what happens in the Alamgir court, I couldn't tell you. But if you ask us what is the pattern in Uttar Pradesh or in Western Bihar, we could tell you, right? Those are the kinds of things that we're doing. Um, today we have 23 lakh cases and 1.53 crore hearings in the database between these two um, sets of courts. And overall, just some highlights, three years and two months in the high court. So a case, I understand, appears in the high court after spending many more years in the lower court. So it's like a seven to 10 year process to get something through the legal system. That doesn't come as news to you. And uh, we have all these internal jokes. You know, I come from the software industry and the software industry has made all its money by billing hours. And lawyers understand that extremely well, right? So there we relate. But unfortunately, that's not good for the consumer. So we need to make some changes there. And some other stuff, if you look at average number of days, uh, four years in the lower courts, adding up to seven years and seven months. This is average. And uh, if you take a standard mean, you probably wind up at much worse numbers. What we have done, I'm not going to spend time on this, what we have done is, we have taken all this data and put it together in an online, ooh, you can't even see this, can you? Let me see if I can make this a little better. Is that better? Okay. 
So we put this together in, uh, in a portal that anybody can sign up for, anybody can log in, uh, play with the data. The portal has some standard dashboards, and I'm just going to kind of flip through that. Uh, if you look at overall, what do I do? We have some, we have stuff about high court specifically. We have stuff about district courts. We are in the process of putting together a dashboard specifically for each high court. See, one of the key, key problems that we have come to after looking at this data for six, eight months is, okay, so now we have data. So what? What are we going to do with it? Ultimately, how is the system going to change? And uh, I have to tell you, in a conversation uh, with Mr. Ramchandran in Delhi, he pointed out that ultimately, judges become judges to write judgments, right? Which means that if, if you want to incentivize change, to me, as, as a businessman, I'm looking at how do we incentivize change. If you want to incentivize change in the system, you have to give people some real need to do what they want, or some give, give them opportunity to do what they want. If judges want to write judgments, and if you're forcing them sitting to sit for five and a half hours every day, every day looking at 50, 60 hearings, those are the numbers. The average number of hearings for a high court judge in this country is 54 per day. In five hours, that's less than five minutes per hearing. We actually have a cricket score board that says nine minutes, but it's five to nine minutes. That's what judges are doing. That's not what they want to do, right? They want to write judgments. How do we enable that? What can we do with the data? What patterns can we figure out that will give judges some capability, some insight to make administrative choices? After all, judges are also in charge of specific districts. Each, each senior judge has a bunch of districts that he or she is in charge of. Can we give them information at least about the lower courts? Okay, they may not be able to change what is happening in the high court itself. But in the districts they are in charge of, can they make a difference? Can we, put, can we do? One of the things we learned in the political side of things, you know, when we started on the political side, we started doing surveys, we started putting the scorecards. And people used to tell us, ah, politicians don't care about scorecards. But the reality is, politicians do care. We have had cases where people have called Harish and said, look, I know you won't tell me my score, but just let me know when it's going to appear in the paper so that I'll be prepared. Because when it appeared, each politician's scorecard would appear along with other people in the same district. MLAs in the same district would be grouped together and printed in the newspapers. So you're saying, can we do something like that? Can we put statistics together in dashboard that display how district courts are doing? And can we enable judges to make choices? We don't know if we can. Now, you know, we we'll listen to him and tell us maybe we can. But at least, at least the data is available to think of solutions. That's primarily where we are. Any questions? Thanks. Thanks, Kishor. Okay, we'll come to the main event of the day. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Raju Ramachandran, who is our speaker today. Um, the difficulty with introducing somebody who one looks up to, has looked up to for about 15 years now, is that you don't know where to start and where to begin. So I thought I won't um, jump into a long introduction, because I'm sure many of you know uh, about Mr. Ramachandran. Um, all I would like to say is he's been a great mentor to me personally, even though I've as we were discussing before the lecture, I only interned as a student with him for about two months, but the impact of those two months has, on me has been uh, very significant. So, um, as all of you are aware, Mr. Ramachandran um, was the addition, for additional solicitor general of India for, um, in, uh, during the Vajpayee government. Uh, he's appeared in many cases, uh, but more than, the, more than Mr. Ramachandran, the lawyer, what many of us who have interacted with him know is Mr. Ramachandran, the person, um, the person who holds high ethical standards in a profession where it's a challenge, and who has taught many of us how to behave with younger lawyers, how to behave with clients, 
um, and how to behave in a very human way. So having um, said that, I'll stop and um, request him to um, deliver the lecture. Um, he will talk for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open the uh, floor for discussion and questions. Thank you. thank you, Daksh. Thank you, Harish. And thank you all for coming. 1951, one year after we the people gave ourselves this constitution. Jawaharlal Nehru said, this magnificent constitution that we have framed has been kidnapped and purloined by lawyers. When he said lawyers, he meant lawyers and judges. He meant the robed fraternity. Many kidnappings and purloinings have happened since then. But the most egregious kidnapping of recent times happened on the 16th of October this year when the Supreme Court struck down the Constitution 99th Amendment and the NJAC Act, which tried to bring in a new constitutional regime <coughs> governing the appointment of judges. Now, let us start with some basics. We the people have given ourselves this constitution, which embodies the rule of law. If judges have been given the power by our constitution to strike down laws of parliament which violate fundamental rights. Later, of course, came the basic structure of theory. In essence, the constitution has given the judges a political role. The role of the higher judiciary, therefore, let us all be clear, is a political role. And therefore, if we the people have given such vast powers to the judges, do we the people have the right to participate in the process of appointment of judges? Or should judges self-select? Mr. Arun Jaitley used a very attractive expression. It says, should it be a gymkhana club where members decide who the new members are going to be? Now this question, therefore, needs to be viewed not as an executive and legislator, <coughs> the legislature on the one side and judiciary confrontation on the other, but as something which concerns the whole culture of constitutionalism in our country. Now let's get one more judicially evolved concept clear. The basic structure theory. <coughs> Till the Golaknath case in 1967, it was accepted that Parliament's power to amend the constitution was untrammeled. 
it was 17 years later in the Gorakhnath case that the Supreme Court, by a narrow majority, said that no, Parliament's power to amend the constitution cannot touch the fundamental rights. And then later, again by a majority judgment, the largest ever bench of the Supreme Court held that the power of Parliament to amend the constitution does not extend to abrogating the basic structure of the constitution. Now, disclosure first. I am a known critic of the basic structure doctrine on conceptual grounds, but that is irrelevant for the purpose of today's talk and discussion. We proceed on the basis as we have to that the basic structure theory is the law of the land. Now the basic structure is not defined in the constitution itself. It is spelt out by judges on a case by case basis. And though interestingly, the Keshwaranda Bharti case, which first propounded this theory, though different judges set out illustrative examples of what might constitute the basic structure, not one judge says independence of the judiciary is part of the basic structure. Justice Khanna says possibly judicial review, but independence of the judiciary was not set out in illustrations given by the judges themselves as part of the basic structure. But that doesn't matter. If there is a basic structure theory, I don't think there can be any quarrel with the proposition that independence of the judiciary is part of the basic structure of the constitution, as is democracy, as is separation of powers, as is a system of checks and balances. But the problem arises when, while analyzing the basic structure, you forget the architecture, you forget the design, and you come down to individual bricks. Let me just develop this a little. When you talk of a structure, four professions are involved. Architecture, civil and structural engineering, masonry, and bricklaying. Now, when you strike down an amendment to the constitution, are you going to look at how the architecture is damaged, how the structure is damaged, or are you going to look at the color of individual bricks and the quality of individual bricks and say that if one brick is replaced by another, the basic structure is violated. And that is the central problem with this judgment, which we will come to as we get into more details. Now, what the constitution envisage, and normally when we talk of basic structure, we think of the original constitution. Though conceivably you can say that when significant additions are made, then in due course, those additions may become basic. That's something debatable. And it can happen. But when we are talking of the basic structure theory in the context of our relatively young constitution, we are talking of the original constitution. Now, what was basic in the matter of judicial appointments as far as the original constitution was concerned? It was 
this particular feature that the president which means the executive did not have the untrammeled right to appoint judges to the superior judiciary unlike the case with many constitutions around the world where the executive had the absolute <coughs> right to appoint judges and such constitutions are constitutions of countries which boast of judiciaries no less independent than ours but a choice was made that the president that is the executive will not have this untrammeled right and that he would do it in consultation with the chief justice of india and such other judges of the supreme court who whom he might find fit to consult now in the first judges case 1981 the supreme court accepted the position that what article 124 of the constitution envisaged was consultation consultation of course means due way due regard deference but consultation did not mean concurrence but the first judges case 1993 reversed this position and in my view rewrote the constitution to hold that in effect this is what it meant and the court advanced an interesting theory for this the court viewed it from the point of view of competence to select who which is the best institution to select judges it is the judiciary because lawyers are made judges courts are the arena of their performance and therefore judges are best equipped to assess the suitability of candidates for judgeship and so there is really no question of primacy as such if you look at it from the point of view of who is best equipped it is the judiciary and therefore the question gets resolved that it is ultimately the judiciary now that judgment as i said was an egregious rewriting of the constitution but the political class did not stand up at that time did not assert itself at that time the surrender of the political class to judicial supremacy was evident from 1973 after the keshavan and the bharti case because when the first inroad was made the golaknath case there was at least one strong champion of parliamentary rights socialist mp nath pai who made it his life's mission to get the judgment of the supreme court in golaknath overruled by the constitutional process but that was not to be that surrender which started post keshavananda bharti and that was because the emergency came soon after that and so the political class also felt that no the only thing which stood between dictatorship and the people was the supreme court of the basic structure theory and therefore 
in 1993 there was no political consensus then came 1998 1993 while rewriting the constitution the supreme court created a constitutional institution called the collegium and defined its composition in 1998 the supreme court in its own interest because the collegium as originally envisaged by it was not working the way it wanted to because of problems with particular appointments and particular judges in the collegium it self redefined the collegium to make it larger five instead of three the experience of the collegium system over the years ultimately led to this rare unanimity in the political class which led to this major amendment being passed let's briefly recapitulate what the features were the national judicial appointments commission would have a chief justice of india and two senior most judges as ex officio members the executive was represented by a lone member the law minister and a very refreshing innovation civil society was brought in by prescribing that there would be two eminent members one of whom would be from among either scs scs obcs minorities or women a refreshing innovation in the interest of diversity